from the hospital. It goes out from the hospital into the waterways, also um, goes directly into water for aquaculture. Um, and then, of course, the manure, uh, the residues of antibiotics are going down into um, the crop farming system and out into the waterways. So this is a way of talking about um, the ways that the antibiotics are going into the system and the potential routes of transmission um, of antimicrobial resistance as well. So we see here this shift then in a policy towards wanting to reduce antibiotic use, having for a while, and we saw it that uh, in this picture, um, antibiotic use being lower in some areas of the world, although still very, very high um, in high income countries, um, this increasing desire to do something about this escalating antibiotic use um, and recognition of the growing problem of antimicrobial resistance, given the dried up pipelines um, that we're reminded mean that we don't have enough antibiotics coming um, to replace those that become uh, less useful. But we end up, when we're doing this, often berating people. And I like this example um, from the World Health Organization campaign a few years back, which is telling us that misuse of antibiotics puts us all at risk. Um, and it's telling us don't use antibiotics like sweets, because this idea is that people will go around using antibiotics as though they are just eating a sweet. In many areas of the world, that's not the case. That's not relevant. People are people have a poor access to antibiotics, even the first line antibiotics. Um, but this idea that antibiotics are being used like sweets and that people need to be told not to needs to be put into the context of antibiotics um, themselves and the way that they've been marketed. If we go back a few decades, we can see here antibiotics being marketed and sold as sweets. These candets is a tube of sweets that you can suck and it has a double antibiotic action. It fights germs, not just one, but two. Safe, proven antibiotics kill many irritating, um, irritation causing throat germs on contact. And it has an anesthetic action. So it's not an ordinary cough drop. Candets are proven medication. Get them at your drugstore. And then we wonder why we and we end up starting telling people off for using antibiotics like sweets when they were actually designed and um, designed as sweets and manu and um, manufactured and sold and advertised in that way. And we also have to remember that there's been a huge amount of work over decades for trying to get essential medicines to people, which we end up trying to, if we're not careful, trying to undo when we're telling people to stop using antibiotics. And I think one of the things that we end up having to remember is that we need to ask the question, are we wanting to protect people or are we wanting to protect medicines? And when we start getting on to a hardline stewardship campaign, we may forget that we're trying to protect people in the end um, and that protecting medicines is just a means to that end. So this leads us on to having a look at the agenda for addressing AMR and AMU more widely. The question that I'm often asked is, why are people misusing antibiotics so much? Is it for themselves and their pets and their livestock? Why are prescribers carrying on using antibiotics in these incorrect ways? It would be ideal if this was simply a matter of correcting misunderstandings to correct what is clearly a misuse. But in practice, I think we all know that it's not actually very easy to spot misuse, as there are usually logics for using antibiotics um, in a given scenario. And similarly, we might be tempted to raise awareness as a measure to stop people using antibiotics. Surely, if they understand the consequences, then they'll be more careful. But what if we've what we have found is that people's awareness of antimicrobial resistance is actually quite high. They know that this can occur. They know that, that the medicines may just stop working, but they have more pressing concerns. So antibiotics hold a lot of potential. They hold the potential to return to work, to cure this illness or to prevent another. People cannot be educated out of that living life situation. 
we did a review of social research on antimicrobial resistance that was intended to uh, the resistance um, research that was intended to contribute to change. And we found that the majority of this research was focused on practices. And this is important, highlighting how an individual prescriber, this person here or user of antibiotics, is actually subject to many things around them that will impact their decisions. So they might be considering, hmm, well, I don't know, the laboratory is closed, so I'm going to have to make a decision empirically. Um, they may be thinking, gosh, we've got a long queue of people out here, um, so I'm going to have to go quite quickly. So I might not be able to answer, ask all the questions I might like to. Um, they might be thinking, hmm, what will my colleagues think if I uh, don't give an antibiotic, for example? Um, but then they might be also being told by uh, given an incentives by a drug rep who's saying, you know, if you uh, you can create, you know, you can have some extra funding if you do, you know, if you sell three for the price of two, I'll sell you three for the price of two as long as you get through X number in, of antibiotics in a given period of time. So you might have various different incentives that are given um, to try and to tip, tip your decision towards giving an antibiotic. But then you might be seeing the signs on the wall, save our antibiotics. So, and you might know that there's nothing else to give in the pharmacy. So you might give an antibiotic even if you're not really that sure if it's going to do anything. So all of these things are logical, reasonable decisions to make, um, particularly if you've got this long queue and you know that your patient's not gonna come back again. But also we were aware that this is only one particular way of looking at the problem. So here, when we're trying to find the answers to these questions of what this individual is thinking about what they're going to do. We're placing this person at the center of a diagram. You may have seen this, um, these diagrams made around behavior that put the person in the middle and all of these different uh, influencing factors around them like concentric circles. But there's quite a lot of scholarship that says that we, when we're thinking about the social or biosocial world, we need to stop putting people and their thinking and their think boxes, their brains in the center of the diagram. We need to decenter people and we need to see what else we might see if we take them out of the middle of the diagram. What else might we see about why antibiotics are used so much if we stop being quite so preoccupied with human agency? And how might antibiotic use be responded to differently if we studied it differently? Our research in our anthropology team has been using ethnographic research to try to do this. So situating antibiotic use and following antibiotic use in as part of social, political and economic processes. So here you're following the antibiotics, but you're also following them in context not necessarily just following people's logics. And to do this, we use ethnographic research, which is um, where you're immersing yourself as the research tool. You're, you are the research tool. You're um, immersing and trying to understand what common sense is and how things are working in a particular place and trying to look at those connections um, that are drawn from the thing, the object of study, in this case, antibiotics. What are all the different connections that mean that this antibiotic ends up being here in this lady's um, uh, 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 box of medicines in her home? And we also then look, as I was talking about in the first part of this talk, at the discourses. So that's the ways that ways of talking and creating importance, the ways of making metaphors, the imaginaries and the different histories that are apparent um, when you start to follow an object like antibiotics. And we did this um, across lots of different settings, human health, animal health, and also in orange trees um, and the use of antibiotics for oranges. So we did this ethnographic immersion, also documentary analysis, surveys, and different interventions um, to look at the ways that antibiotics 
um, use occurs. One of the um, methods that we use for the survey um, was a drug bag method, which is where we um, would go to um, uh, somebody's home or a farm and we would show them a whole bag of antibiotics. So we would collect those antibiotics from locally available sources and we'd show them the antibiotics and we'd ask them to tell us about the ones that they used, tell us about the ones that they really wanted to be able to use but hadn't been able to get hold of, tell us about the ones they were completely unfamiliar with so that we could see um, the significance of these, these different antibiotics locally. And we wanted to do this because otherwise what people tend to do is they say things like, have you used an antibiotic? Hmm, what does antibiotic mean? Could that mean ibuprofen? Or are we all understanding the same thing by the word antibiotic? Also, was that, was that one that was in a drip? Was that an antibiotic? Um, being able to see it and feel it allows you to have, um, we argue, a stronger recall and, and a higher accuracy but also then allows people to tell you stories about when they've used these medicines and allows you to get a much deeper understanding um, of what's happening and what people's uh, needs are, what their felt imperatives are, um, and um, how antibiotics end up being part of people's lives. So we've done uh, research with the drug bag method in a number of different places um, with the antimicrobial um, Anthropology of Antimicrobial Resistance team. Um, and here's some of the studies that we've done uh, across different settings. We've actually done various other countries, but this is just one schematic that I made to talk about the fact that we were covering formal healthcare scenarios, informal care, informal livelihoods, um, and uh, livelihoods uh, around farming as well. And across the group we share our different interests and have been kind of uh, collaborating together um, and together we end up finding that antibiotics have these much vaster roles in people's lives than we might first think. We might think of antibiotics really as just something that is a transaction that happens during a consultation and what we need to do to fix the problem of overuse of antibiotics is just tell people to stop giving people antibiotics but actually we found antibiotics were really, really importantly um, part of survival and part of life in, in lives that are marked by precarity. And what I mean by precarity is this um, state of being where you're, not, you're so uncertain about what's going to happen next. You don't know whether you're going to have work. You don't know whether you're going to have health. You don't know whether you're going to have food by tomorrow or in a few weeks time. So you live in this um, chronic state of precariousness and you are having to withstand multiple external forces that affect your own security, whether that's your physical security or um, ability to have a secure income, um, ability to securely keep your children in school, um, ability for your home to be secure from an infections. In this top left picture here, this is um, a picture I took in one of our field sites in, um, in Kampala, Uganda, where um, people live in informal settlements. This is the day after there was a, there was, um, a very heavy rainfall um, the night before, and the, the channel that's right next to these informal houses they're called informal because they're not supposed to be there they're supposed to be you know this is not a recommended place to live and part of that is because the channel rises up and floods lots of you can see this rubbish that's left in so the flood has just gone back out and people's homes were you know several feet high during the flood um in um, really filthy water including a lot of feces there aren't enough toilets here so people um, do what's, what I've heard called uh, flying toilets where you do your business in a bag and then and then chuck it into um, in, into a, um, a, an offshoot of the channel so whilst it's easy to blame people for living in these places that becomes a convenient way to keep them there 
But actually, this is also a very convenient form of labour um, for the city. It's convenient to have people who are willing to live in these scenarios. And you can, by criminalising them, then you can keep them in these spaces. So it becomes a convenient way of having um, uh, whole populations and growing populations of people for whom you do not have to give um, prov provision of infrastructure um, and the times that these uh, people living in informal settlements um, come to matter is mainly, it has been argued, at times of um, political campaigning um, in, for votes and in times of war where you need people, um, people's bodies and the rest of the time people are left in a situation, so it's argued, of kind of being criminalised and being told that they're not supposed to be there, so it's their own fault if they get problems. But we found here huge antibiotic use um, because, of course, people had chronic diarrhoea all the time. Um, so the use of metronidazole was incredibly high, about 87% within the last week had used, um, of, of respondents had used antibiotics. Um, and most of those were metronidazole. So it's a re and, and here we found people having to um, take antibiotics um, in order to keep themselves going so that they could um, do the labour that they needed to do today. They can't think beyond that. They can't take time off to go and lie in bed. So um, we have similar stories from each of our different settings in more rural areas, in commercial pig farming, um, in terms of uh, rural wash and so on. So the ways in which antibiotics end up being used is a form of um, uh, a, a way to address vulnerability, a way to protect your investment, a way to substitute hygiene. Um, so these different, and it is a means to create, a, to, to chase opportunities um, that are presented um, in a rubric of um, entrepreneurial lives and livelihoods that we see so commonly um, embraced in modern societies today and societies that seek to achieve particular forms of modernity. So these in-depth ethnographic studies allow us to start to see a different form of significance, different connections from these medicines to parts of our lives and parts of our global, globalised economies um, that are simply overlooked if you do a survey of people's knowledge of antibiotic resistance or their uh, whether they know whether they've used an antibiotic or not. Those things are missed if you simply ask somebody their age and gender and number of years in education. The only things then that are amenable to change end up being, well, it looks like women use more antibiotics and people with less education. So let's educate women is the conclusion. But is that really the right conclusion to reach when we are able to tell these kinds of stories about the realities of why we've become so entangled with these medicines um, and we look back at the history of how this has happened we start to see a different scale of change that is required if we want to address this problem so we've described this in a quite simplistic cartoon here um, where we talk about antibiotics as a quick fix here we talk about the ways that antibiotics have come to shore up broken systems where you've got poor, um, uh, poor, poorly managed health systems um, and poor infrastructure where antibiotics come to substitute hygiene. They come to enable productivity, whether that's human bodies or, or, um, or animal bodies, and that they come to um, in as an answer for inequality. So here we see Again, the ways we're trying to show the ways that antibiotics are connected to much bigger questions than simply education of health workers or telling patients to stop demanding these medicines. So here we can end up recognising that antibiotics are infrastructural. They're part of the infrastructure um, of our worlds. They're part of the material infrastructure the part of the affective infrastructure, the ways that we relate to each other, and they're part of the political infrastructure. And actually, we can then say that they are 
beyond being a quick fix for particular things in particular scenarios, they're actually become so embedded that they've become mundane parts of life that become very difficult to disentangle. They're just there in our supply chains. To change that will be very difficult. They actually end up being written into our algorithms in ways that makes it difficult to imagine giving care without giving an antibiotic. Um, they're written in without realizing into several SDGs and they're written into people's investment plans and portfolios. So all of these areas end up continuing the antibiotic uh, use around the world as it currently stands without necessarily that being with a person's head in the middle making those decisions. This is things that just make it possible that make antibiotics an inevitable solution to problems without necessarily having somebody sitting and thinking about that and making a plan that makes it so. It's become part of the mundane socio-technical networks of life. We've described these different three different areas, those practices, structures and networks as three different domains that social science has, um, has shown us are ways that antibiotic use has ended up um, uh, being part of different uh, part of our world and these are different ways of seeing that and looking at ways to address it um, so you can look this up if you are interested I wanted to just quickly mention about multidisciplinarity um, the research that we've done couldn't have been done just by social scientists alone we've had to work collectively with lots of other disciplines but first, just to say within the social sciences, the sciences, there are many different types of social science. This is a meeting that we uh, held in 2018, which had people from 40 different countries around the world. We had 110 different social scientists from lots of different disciplines. Um, and so we need to be working together as well, the social sciences and humanities. Um, and we made this website to try and pro provide a platform for that. So I encourage you to have a look at that if you're interested, antimicrobialsinsociety.org. We have um, some essential readings, some people um, and projects and different themes covered on there. Um, but we also must look at that interchange between the biological and social sciences. And this is me doing, I was plating some bacteria and, and I went on to do some susceptibility testing, it's really important to recognize um, what goes into other disciplines and how they're coming to their, uh, their conclusions, um, not to try and become another discipline, but to understand how that works. And that can lead to new kinds of questions um, and new kinds of scientific learning. Um, so learning the other sciences helps across both sides um, to see uh, to see gaps and to see ways forward for us to collaborate to create new knowledge. <laughs> and of course, between epidemiology, pharmacy, um, veterinary and clinical medicine, some of the questions we might ask are around counting, counting antibiotic use, counting antimicrobial resistance, who and what should count, how should we stratify those, those data? And most recently, there's been much more recognition that we need to catch capture data on gender. Why was that not captured before? The need to recognize that data is not neutral and is not value free. And these kinds of things can really come through from multidisciplinary working. Um, this is another example of a paper that we wrote across a whole load of different disciplines and um, people coming from uh, from the UN agencies as well, trying to talk about how do we address antimicrobial resistance um, and, and really learning across, you know, history, law, environmental sciences, as well as, as biological and social sciences. So um, again, this, you can look this up if you're interested. Um, so that's where I wanted to get to today um, just to give a quick acknowledgement this is some of my team on zoom um, of, of our group of, anti uh, of uh, anthropology of AMR um, so thanks very much to them and thank you to you for listening
Thank you very much, Dr. Chandler. My name is Anastasia. So Daniel is having a bit of uh, some network challenges. So I'll be taking over until he can get back on. So at this point in time, ambassadors, I know that you all have, yes, thank yous are <laughs> flocking in. Um, I'd like to ask if anyone has a question. In case your network is not so good, you could type it in the chat box or you could raise your hand um, because you don't really have much time. <laughs> You're receiving a lot of thank yous, Dr. Chandler. That's thank nice. So I'm, just, I'm reading through the chat. Okay, so we have one question in from Musonda. So the question is, oh, no, it's not a question. It's just more thank yous. Yeah. But we do have a hand up. Oh, yes, please. Yes, please. Masa Messe. Um, thank you so much, Miss Claire, for this amazing presentation. Um, I got to learn a lot how different cultures and society affect the progress of a fight against AMR. Um, during the course of your presentation, you mentioned how antibiotics use affect our social and cultural relations to AMR sensitization. But I don't understand how antibiotic use can be associated to political progresses. How can antibiotic use be associated to increase in political progresses? How can antibiotic use be associated with? To political progresses. To political progress. Yes. Um, so there's a number of different ways that antibiotic use ends up being part of um, the political process. So I think you're referring to where I'm saying it's part of um, the, the kind of progressive desire for modernity. Um, and part of that is the way that we need to use antibiotics in order to standardize our products, for example, in order for them to be um, regulated and exchanged on global markets, um, in order for us to maximize the productivity of our animals and people use antibiotics, whether it's effective or not, to, um, to get the largest and most rapid growth out of their pigs and their poultry um, because of the idea of always trying to um, to get the most out of uh, of a market and that's obviously a characteristic of the way that we think mater modernity should take us we should be able to grow more produce more be more use our time more efficiently so um, antibiotics allow us to follow this script of a particular tempo of life, a particular way of being um, that chases opportunities. And that, I would argue, is a political, um, a political way of being. It's what we would call a political economy, um, which is around the, I don't know if you know the phrase, the idea of neoliberalism. It's around creating societies that are based on a market-based ideology. Does that answer the question a little? Um, yes, Ms. Gray, thank you. Thank you very we much, Dr. Chan. Mm -hmm. On to Emmanuel. Emmanuel, can you hear us? Uh, I think, okay, I think Emmanuel has gone off. Should we go to Mohammed? Yes, please. Okay, thank you, Dr. Clear, for that wonderful presentation. Um, just to confirm, am I audible? Yes. Okay, nice. So um during the course of your presentation, you used a well-illustrated cartoon to um, describe how antibiotics could fix productivity, hygiene, poor health um, systems, but I didn't quite get how antibiotics could fix inequality. Can you um, expand on that? Thank you. 
So there are a number of different ways in which people try to use. And when I uh, when I say it can fix these things, it's a critique. I'm not saying it should be fixing those things. I'm saying we should fix those things with other routes and not use antibiotics to fix them, just to be clear. Um, in terms of the inequality, when we see people using antibiotics, for example, as mass treatment for children, I don't know if you're familiar with, there was some MDA um, mass drug administration um, trials that were done not that long ago that showed um, that we're, we're trying to deal with other diseases, um, but they did mass drug administration of antibiotics for children um, and found that children who had had anti regular antibiotic treatment, which was intended, I think this was actually for um, for a different for a specific disease for for um, I think for trachoma. Um, they actually ended up finding that just in general, the health of those children was better. But these were really, really poor children from very disadvantaged backgrounds that they ended up trying to push a recommendation, a particular very well-known philanthropist ended up saying, well, now we should just give all, all under five children in Africa antibiotics, and particularly those from poor backgrounds as a regular basis, as a way to um, to reduce child mortality. But of course, what you're actually trying to do then is to address the fact that there is such inequality that some people's um, lives can actually be improved just by using antibiotics on a routine basis. What I'm arguing is that we should be trying to fix that inequality rather than ending up finding ourselves using antibiotics to fix it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Tenla. Um, in the chat room, you're receiving a lot of thank yous because your presentation was just simply superb. Um, it's exactly 8 p. Okay, it's exactly 8 p.m. in GMT plus three. Wouldn't want to really encroach on your time, so please, in do you have some time, some few more minutes to answer one more question, or we could send them to you because there's another question in the chat room afterwards. That's fine, I can do another five minutes. Um, I can see one in the chat and I can see that Adrian has had their hand up for a while. So I can thank take you. the hand up and then the one in the chat. Uh, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation regarding contribution of anthropologists to antimicrobial, antimicrobial resistance. My question is regarding uh, poultry industry. No, nowadays, the modern poultry industry is using uh, antibiotic as growth promoter. And you know that this has impact, impact on, uh, on human health. For example, the human, the, the human the, or the people are, consu are consuming the, the meat produced from the poultry industry. Then you see that when they are using those antibiotic as the growth promoter can contribute to antibiotic Corobial resistance in, in human. So I wonder how this issue is going to, to be fixed in the next future, in the next future. Because uh, those poultry farmers, poultry industry are looking for, for the profit, but not regardless the, the effect of all this antibiotic use as growth promoter to the health of human. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, so um, I think, I think actually the, the evidence, as you imply, the evidence that um, that antibiotics actually are effective at promoting growth is, is not strong. So the evidence that was initially presented in the States back in the 1950s to say that antibiotics should be used as growth promoters for poultry was actually um, those analyses were rerun recently and found that um, that the data did not support that they were that antibiotics actually help with growth promotion. But what antibiotics can end up doing is offering an alternative to biosecurity. Um, and biosecurity is incredibly expensive, um, particularly when you combine it with having to have security full stop for your animals. Um, and we know that security is a huge issue with people um, feeling that they're or, and having experience of their animals being stolen. So you already have to employ security. And then to have biosecurity is really something that we've found can only happen very well at a, quite a large scale 
operations. So these medium to small scale operations where people are trying to use, as you say, these intensified farming methods. And they're often using these exotic breeds of animal, um, which means kind of a foreign breed that is that is more is seen to be more vulnerable. Um, they they tend to be faster growing and you get more meat, but you have to really look after them. Um, and so it ends up being that one of the best, the easiest ways to look after them is to give them more antibiotics, um, you know, both to reduce infection, well, mainly to reduce infection likelihood um, and, and to protect your investment. Um, so, so I think it is, I think the gro the growth promotion is a little bit of a red herring. Um, people do use them because they think there's going to be a growth promotion aspect, but I think moreover people use them to protect their investments. Um, certainly in the research we've been doing. I hope that answers your question. Um, and then the question in the chat is about gender studies, um, and the point that I was making about. Um, if we find that women use antibiotics more than men and we find that um, the people who are better educated uh, use fewer antibiotics, for example, then we might say, well, let's just educate more women. And I was asking whether that's the right answer. Um, and the question from Ntuba here is, um, can you shed more light on how else we can get better targeted interventions from our research conclusions? And I think that my point actually here was less was was that this is why we need to do qualitative studies when you only do a survey and you're asking about three exposure variables. If you're doing epidemiology, you have your outcome variable. Did you use an antibiotic and your various exposure variables, your age, your gender, your level of education? Those are our typical ones. Um, then you can only get so far in understanding what's happening. So you get, well, women are using them more, let's educate women. And the reason that women might be using them more might be nothing to do with um, things that they need to be educated about. It may well be for completely other reasons that need to be addressed. For example, we've done studies about antibiotic use and, and sex work. Um, and the and the reasons that people are using antibiotics there, so it's not because of education, a lack of education. It's because um, of having to um, to protect themselves um, from from disease. So people using basically using antibiotics prophylactically sometimes. Um, so the so the reason that some people might be using antibiotics wouldn't be detected with the survey, which only has a limited number of questions. So really, my plea was was that we do more qualitative research to actually understand the situation um, rather than survey research where we exclude so much information just by using a few, um, a few yes, no answers. So I hope that answers your question. Um, there's one final question here I'll, I'll go for, which is I would like to ask, what's the link between anthropology and infection prevention control? So anthropology, you're welcome. Anthropology, um, anthropologists can study anything, as I was hoping to get across, anthropologists can study anything. Um, in infection prevention control, one of the big challenges we see is why is there a fall off? Every time we do um, an intervention, we get people all enthusiastic and they'll all be washing their hands. And every time we see a fall off after a few weeks or months and everything goes back to how it was before. And what I'm saying is that I think that if we can understand the culture and the wider varieties, a variety, wider variety of things that mean that we end, that we um, that that we do our practices in the way that we do in hospitals in terms of IPC, um, then we have a much higher chance of designing interventions that are going to be more sustainable. So um, understanding IPC from an ethnographic perspective could give you a much richer understanding rather than um, the usual methods of just saying, well, let's educate people and, and have, a, have a champion. And we know that the sustainability of those interventions is really um, often quite poor. So that was really the link that I was trying to make was the ability to study those questions from a, an immersive 
um, perspective that draws out different kinds of connections rather than just thinking um, that the world is centered around what somebody has decided to do or not, um, which requires them to continuously decide that they're going to do something. There are other ways that we can change um, change IPC without having to tap into people's decision making every time. So, uh, thank you. Thank, I'll thank pass you so back much. Back to you, Daniel. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Claire, for that presentation. I am. I, I, I am really sorry. I was lo I lost my 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 power, so my wife went down. Uh, my Second substitute network let me off, but I'm back and I've been able to catch a, a good glimpse of, of the presentation. And thank you so much for shedding uh, uh, quite some good light for us today. We really do appreciate and also want to appreciate my co COP uh, moderator, that is Anastasia, and uh, everyone for attending the session today. And I think, uh, Dr. Cray, you've really challenged us that we really need more qualitative researchers. We need to understand the why uh, behind everything and uh, really, you know, not just look at things from uh, uh, just one way uh, or a, a dichotomy where we it's either right or wrong and nothing else really applies. So thank you so much. It has been really a pleasure having you with us today. And uh, you really uh, do a lot of great work and you inspire a lot of us uh, behind here. Uh, uh, to also uh, do much uh, just by looking at what you've been able to accomplish. Yeah. So maybe you can share with us your final remarks. Then I think we can call it a day so that we don't take so much of your time. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Um, and good luck to everybody with all the work you're doing. It's fantastic to see so many of you working on this. And I look forward to hearing updates of how you're all getting on um, and, and all the activities that, that you're doing in relation to AMR and much beyond. So thank you very much for having me and thank you for the excellent questions um, and good luck to everybody. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, I wish us all a wonderful evening and uh, thanks so much everyone. And yeah, uh, uh, maybe Dr. Clay, you can also share your presentation so that we stay able to share it with the, with the team. Okay, right. bye everyone and have a wonderful bye. evening.